Welcome everyone, thank you so much for being here and thank you Maxon for organizing us and um, allowing us to share a bit more about our work. Working in Film and TV is really interesting because every time you work on such exciting projects and then you can talk about it for like one or two years. So um, we're pretty happy because there's quite a few new things that came out um, uh, that we've been working on recently. So that's pretty exciting examples to show. Uh, but in particular, we'll be talking about how we bridge the gap and we're gonna define the gap later on. So, uh, cause it can mean like so many things, but in particular in film and TV, um, between different departments, in particular between our department and the effects department, set construction, etc. There's always this sort of gaps of communication, of sharing information, of sort of like understanding each other. And that's where painting practice falls really, where um, digital art department, which works so hand in hand uh, between our department and the VFX, um, and is just trying to solve really creative issue. Um, we've been um, a company, well, for 15 years plus, and still going. Uh, and um, uh, we won quite a few awards, so that's always good. Um, and the latest projects that we working on, that we've been working on, that was one of those that we've worked really from start to end. So that goes through uh, from when the script is made all the way down to post visualization. Is these dark materials? Um, I'm just gonna briefly go through a show reel uh, of some of like our latest work, so that you can see. Um, Um, have another show reel that's incredibly long, so we're just going to show a part of it. But we've also been uh, working on motion design. This is one of the things that we also do. Um, so we can see some of the examples here. Black Mirror was is always a good example because I mean Dan's gonna probably speak about it later as well. But it's, you sometimes get these shows where, um, well, thanks to your creative skills, you have to figure out ways of realizing the scripts uh, with without having perhaps the budgets at all time and things like this. So uh, Black Mirror was a, quite an interesting one because it was also uh, one of those shows where Dan and Joel, who's uh, also a founder of painting practice, is production designer and executive producer now, uh, had to look at new ways of exploring early virtual production as well in a non-virtual production way. So that was always really interesting. But yeah, some of uh, our recent work, uh, as you can see, is, uh, some of them not coming out yet, but um, we're pretty excited about this one. It's gonna be coming out soon, uh, but um, yeah. What we do, so we're in the full rebranding times <laughs> right now to try and summarize this better. Uh, but uh, it, 
it really goes once again from like visual development to everything that's like a visual problem that we try to get in and solve it with like creative skills within the company but there's also some R&D uh, we play a lot with once again virtual production trying to figure out uh, how we can be more efficient how the pipeline can become more efficient uh, for us but also for like the production uh, that we work uh, that we work on we also do some VFX uh, consultation and planning and finally the graphic works so it's very diverse as you can see, and when there's so much going on, with quite a small team, uh, the small team that we are, um, well, you have to sort of understand how you want to plan things ahead and sort of construct a pipeline that doesn't drive everyone mad. Um, and this is um, really what we've been, every year we get better at it. There's no perfect solution. You just have to do the work and um, try and figure out what's best and continue to improve upon it, be open-minded about new things, new softwares that you can use, etc. But in particular, basing ourselves on these softwares, that's what's allowed us to a lot to like sort of keep a continuity in the work that we do. Uh, I mean, Cinema 4D is with us from like start to end. Uh, that's where we do all our modeling, uh, that's where we create the environments that we either implement into a real engine or that we will pass on to a concept artist to build concept art upon and so forth. So, yeah, the, the sort of process that we go through is, depending from the project, there, there will be projects in which sometimes we'll just jump in once again to solve a creative issue and that might require just figuring out a set or figuring out the mood and how things are gonna look so we threw out concept art. But in general when we work on long format like series from start to end, uh, we'll really start from you know like the very beginning with the script and so forth and trying to understand how you wanna visualize that script uh, on the screen. And that comes with a lot of art direction, production design, but also pre-visualization, which is, um, it's quite a wide word really, because it's like sort of understanding how ahead of time, how everything's gonna look like once it's, uh, well, on final image, but it will uh, require also understanding camera work, how you wanna sort of uh, film the scenes and the set that you have available. And all this work allows you to be more efficient in the end, especially on very like, heavy VFX series uh, because, I mean, VFX budgets are the ones that are always really scary for every production. So understanding ahead of time how, um, how much things are going to cost and so forth is what allows you to um, sort of get a better understanding and planning of things throughout time. So this is a scary <laughs> visualization of uh, what I just told you about, but you can see that there's, you know, it's a, supposedly a linear workflow but not really because you have like a lot of coming back to you know ideas before and exchanges and so forth so the, vin okay. the sorry the VFX workflow wants to be linear but yeah. the pre-production workflow is very non-linear and one of the things that we do is basically try and feed both and keep both parties happy and it becomes kind of like you know the Technical pipelines are often very, very linear, but creative pipelines, you need to be able to like adapt and mm -hmm. do stuff very quick. And Cinema 4D is very, um, you know, good at deal dealing with those kind of things. Um, yeah, I mean, the, well, that's, that's really, once again, some of the, with having to deal with those different pipelines and sort of way these departments are planning, uh, we get quite a lot of issues. Um, in the sort of art VFX pipeline, uh, which makes it challenging to, sometimes it's just hard to like get an idea, go from like a point A to a point B, because <laughs> there's so many other little points in between those. There's um, uh, different creative stakeholders as well that uh, have opinions to input on the work. So you have to get back sometimes and then, you know, not everyone agrees and so forth. Well, it's a creative process, right? So that comes with a lot of challenges in and of itself. Um, there's also a tension between 
being very structured because that's how you can actually understand like work once again going from point A to B to C. However, you have fast turnarounds and sometimes someone's going to change their mind and they want new concept art done of this, com of this set in, you know, three hours. So you have to like be able to also be really flexible and get back to the work that you were doing and be able to like have fast turnarounds all while sort of having a pipeline, which is like quite difficult at time. And once again, VFX planning uh, will need some level of previs and storyboarding. Uh, and, and that's the issue where you have to pre-visualize it and storyboard it ahead of time, but sometimes people change their mind about what the set was gonna look like very late on. So then you have to come back and re-pre-visualize it because now everything's changed, so you can't film it the same way and so forth. So it's a very uh, complicated issue in this way. So the gap that we're trying to bridge, well, successfully so, I like to think, uh, is uh, the one, once again, the, the, between all these departments. And the way we do it is, once again, through softwares like Cinema 4D, um, uh, content creation software as well, that differ in the approach in important ways. So that's why we're trying to like just decide on what softwares we're gonna use that work for both departments, and both departments can understand them and get on with them. Uh, the issue, there's issues with inconsistency of designs and ideas being lost in translation, which once again come from this pipeline being like all over the place. And um, you need to sort of adapt really constantly, especially when you're in between and when your interests are not related to a specific department, but they're just related to having the show and the quality of the show being as good as you can. Um, you, you sort of just have to like figure your way around. So how do we bridge the gap? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So uh, I'm going to, thank you, Evan. I'm going to talk through uh, what I would, we, we recently put together things, these things called asset journeys, which are broadly what a lot of these things uh, sort of lean to in terms of either a set design, a hero character, or a prop. Um, what uh, our company kind of does the best, and we've only, it's taken me like 10, 10 years to actually figure this out, is that end-to-end -end kind of workflow from start to finish uh, and the first time we did that was on Black Mirror um, and it started with just like early visual development of what the show was going to look like to, um, to help like Charlie Brooker kind of envisage this world that he wanted to create and uh, to be honest none of us knew what we were doing at that that moment and how it was but we wanted it to be fresh and we wanted it to be something that people had never seen before uh, and kind of very grounded in a reality even though it was the future of sci-fi so it was very grounded sci-fi uh, and we worked our way through that process and because there was kind of limited budgets um, we had to be very clever about how to do it and we took on as a studio much more than we would normally do so we ended up doing final VFX on stuff uh, and we were literally sort of flying by the seat of our pants uh, so 15 million merits was the show I don't know if it, have any of you guys seen Black Mirror is that yeah a couple so uh, the Daniel Kalor episode where he's in that tiny room with the with the screens weirdly there was actually no VFX budget for that show like none, like I think it was like 20 grand or something. Uh, but they said that oh, we have a line in here for graphics. Uh, so I was like, okay. Uh, so we were left with no, no option other than to basically make that show with all the VFX uh, in camera. So this is even like this is about 10 years ago now. So we were doing a kind of like virtual pre-production way back then. Uh, and the, it allowed us to like bake in all the lighting so that we didn't have to do any keying. and. So Daniel looked great with all the screens because everything he was doing was actually real and we weren't actually doing it after the fact. But it meant, meant we had to pre-design every single graphic. Uh, we had to sync it all. And we used uh, new software uh, to basically queue it up so that when Daniel would press a button or do something, uh, we could see it over the top of the set. The set was tiny. It was kind of like, you know, we're pretty wibbly wobbly and everyone was behind me laptops and it was all plugged into the TV and he's like, he's pressed something, press space bar and then it would play and the poor director was there going, like literally trying to get every shot and we just go, every day we were like, did we, did we, did we make the day? Did we, did we get all those graphics? So I've, I've talked very specifically about that but it's like, it's a great example of like how our studio has to think and to be honest, those kinds of the shows that are the ones that I've on in terms of they need graphic, they need design and they need a kind of new approach and what's great about these tools and softwares is that they kind of sometimes spark ideas. They've got a new feature and you're like, oh, I can use it on this or, or there is a need to tell the story in a creative way and then you have to find, find a new solution to do it. Um, 
So uh, what's this about? Oh, like the, I'm just reminding myself, character animation. So yeah, we do, we do like a vast, vast range of stuff. And because we're a studio that doesn't use, because Cinema 4D especially is kind of niche. It's got a lot of stuff, a lot of artists use motion, mo motion design and motion graphics. It's kind of like, we've been using it in production for a long time. Um, so we've had to make our, a lot of our own assets and pipelines. Um, one thing that is quite hard to get hold of is character animation. There's a, the character riggers are, are, are quite hard to come by. So we use um, sort of the asset libraries and now we're making a whole, we've made a whole library of uh, various age ranges, ethnicities of all these different characters. So we've got a small team of people that make libraries for us so that we can populate scenes throughout the process. So uh, it's quite time consuming. Obviously Unreal Engine have released uh, MetaHuman and MetaHuman is kind of quite, it's quite complex and it's very sophisticated and it's incredible in terms of the graphic fidelity. But with often in this case, we don't need that level of complexity in the scene. We we'll want to make a piece of concept art and the concept artist or the artist is doing that doesn't want to get into a really technical thing. So we'll have uh, artists working almost like on a piece of 2D artwork, but we might have three or four people assisting that process. So you can have like parallels. You can have like the character, the previous artist who are really good at character animation and posing, making a scene in terms of layout. And then you have a really talented artist that's brilliant at painting and lighting. So Cinema 4D will make that scene and it will start as a set design scene that I probably would have started. I'll give that set design uh, and I've been going through that with the production designer in, a, in what we would call a traditional art department. And once that set's kind of established, that set can then live in the uh, previous and layout department so that previous guys can start thinking about um, where the cameras are and um, kind of posing characters. And then you've created a kind of moment or like a film moment, like a shot in the film. And so that the concept artists can then work that out. But the, the previous guys have already like animated it. And then I can take it and work with that as, with a director and we'll animate a shot. Um, so what uh, Paolo here is demoing on this video is like a, 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 you know, how to quickly load libraries. So we've created like a huge amount of animation, some of them Wixmo, some bespoke, so that we can really, really quickly turn these kind of things around. Um, uh, then in the, in the UK, we have a train company called GWR and there's these sort of famous kind of uh, books called The Famous Five. Uh, and we had to come up with a look, look dev of um, illustration for this thing. And they wanted, it was gonna be animated, but they wanted it to be very painterly. So we were like a kind of in uh, the early stages of, sorry, uh, um, look devving, how we were gonna do it. So we had to work um, with another facility that was gonna do all the animation, but there was so, but we, we ended up doing all the map painting. So uh, we concepted the thing and discovered that work with ETC uh, in London to, to kind of create the look. There had to be a nice balance between the, the posters, the traditional posters of like uh, GWR and the famous five novels, but then also work uh, in CG. Um, so this is the, the, the dry part. By the way, if, if any of you are Cinema 4D users and quite technical or interested now, I'm happy to like go in a bit more detail on anything afterwards because um, our talk is kind of quite broad and I'm just trying to talk kind of how we use it, um, but I'm happy to go into kind of the granular. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we would use like cl cloners and volume mesh and things like that are often used in for motion graphics. We use them in slightly um, different ways in terms of I would use them in concept art to uh, dress a scene. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk you through some of um, some examples of, of, of assets and designs that we've done. So uh, on series one of his dark materials, there was this thing called the spy fly. Um, so we would very early doors, we would probably have a Cinema 4D artist uh, model up some prototypes from some 2D sketches, but then we would like render them out um, to do some nice finishes quickly, and they would be iterated upon um, um, in, t in tandem with someone next door sort of doing like um, surface designs and like how it was gonna work um, and like how the mech, mech inside was gonna work. And then we would rig it for previs so that we would there would be this very quick and nimble uh, feedback loop before it's gone to a post half, which can be quite expensive. And it's a little bit more complex in terms of the, the, the system there in terms of artists working all over large, multiple countries on large, you know, large facilities. Usually when we were doing these shows, we're all in a room like this. There's probably about 10 of us and they're all like from very, very different disciplines. And you can just literally really alone and go, well, I just changed the design. So can we re-rig it like that? So we were able to like rig something that we can then use in layout. And we were exploring how it would move um, uh, and then 
it goes up to the art department, they would 3D print prototypes, and then they would come back to us and they changed it, or the designer would changed it because of the size or what we wanted to do, or even the talent, uh, the actor that was going to use it would have an idea, and we quick, quickly have to change it. It would go through all of those processes before um, it goes to uh, Framestore, um, so that when Framestore start doing the shots, they, they don't have to spend, waste money on iterations about what it's going to do and how it's going to work. So the, the shot costs and the asset costs for frame store is kind of protected so that the production value can stay super high. So we kind of act as a kind of creative uh, buffer for, for, for that for the process. Uh, similarly, the um, I don't know this if you're an uh, is dark materials nerd, then this is a big, big deal. But if you're not, then it's like, oh, whatever. What is that? Uh, this is the alethiometer, which is kind of like Lyra's main kind of compass. It's kind of like this magical thing. Um, and it was going to kind of one of these things when you've got a fans, you have like very sensitive uh, fans. You don't want to mess these things up. You have to be like very sympathetic to these sort of things. And so it takes a lot of design, a lot of, iter a lot of iteration. Um, we, we did sort of mock-ups, early mock-ups in Cinema 4D, but then it was done. We, we did these kind of like paint overs in, um, in 2D. But then we did a really detailed model in Cinema 4D. And uh, where I'm working at the moment in Cardiff, we have artists that use cinema and 3D printing and understand about mechanics and engineering in the art department. But then I have artists downstairs in my studio that know how to animate and model and for concepting. So we're working in parallel. And in this case, we were able to build the asset that worked right the way through the whole process. So it, was, it went, went, went through many, many versions, like 100 different designs. But the final one, we were able to 3D print that thing uh, in metal and laser cut it so it all worked. The artist that designed the actual physical prop was real, like um, really into like how it was going to do. It. And we had like various versions that would do different things on set, so that Lyra um, or Daphne Keane, who played Lyra, was able to like interact in a meaningful way. And then when we were in a um, post production, before we handed over the final thing, there was instances where the uh, the VFX, the, the edit producer, was like. We're not telling the story about how the alethiometer works. We need some more kind of shots, cool shots like macro shots of how, how the alethiometer could work. So when she's looking at it, we're not just seeing Daphne just sort of going, we need some like magic. So we used that asset and we made some lovely previs sort of um, look dev of some cool shots so that you could cut to. And then again, that was then handed over and, and done with uh, uh, Friend still doing the final final shots. Um, I talked about this and some stuff on uh, for uh, I did for Epic Games. It kind of gets in a bit more detail if you're interested in this sort of thing. But with large scale environments is our main probably our main thing that we're really good at because um, I'm come from set design. My business partner um, Joel, he's a production designer, but now he's an e uh, exec producer. But he he was a production designer for a long time. So we like we love doing like large scale environments, like what what is called uh, world building and kind of concepts and games. Um, this particular set was really fun. It was um, kind of Arctic port, like a kind of pirate, like sort of strange, sort of scary place in the far north that was fantasy, sort of fantasy with a small F. Um, and what we would do, very, I would, I made this visual here a long, long time ago now. But um, in order to create that, I would make simple models in Cinema 4D. I don't even like UV them. I just box map stuff, make a series of passes so that I can grab IDs, make quick comps, step depth pass and stuff like that again happy to like deep dive into my concept process a little bit afterwards or if i've got more time um here's a kind of like a little lego set um there are companies now doing great work with this stuff there's so much more materials online if you're a lot of design is like through asset bashing and because we're a small studio and we have cg artists need to be kept busy all year round we started like keeping them busy making props and and things like that so between feedback or between jobs we're making libraries of stuff that we can either sell or use on projects so this this sort of asset library became the kind of uh actually i'll go into more detail on that later don't i i better speed up right here's here's more stuff uh there's the daniel color example that's the uh i don't know if you saw that episode um i, I can't even remember the name of it now but we designed the, the evil dog in that that was based on like boston dynamics uh, uh, Ali, who uh, was a concept artist, worked with Joel on that for a long time. But then, you know, they were like horrible, evil looking things. Um, that top frame there was from uh, San Junipero, which is kind of like a virtual heaven. Um, I had to like, we had to do a load of CG shots in the end because we couldn't really find a location where we could get into a server. It was kind of usually protected. So I just did it in CG and animated it and more or less into final shots. And then uh, Glassworks did a lovely job actually delivering and making it look beautiful. Uh, another show I worked on called Beauty and the Beast. I don't know if you've seen that. It's like a Disney uh, live action. Um, I've actually done two Disney castles now, and um, so sort of, I became for a time like the the castle 
castle did, which was kind of fun because that's how I started out as a kid. I used to make little car castles out of uh, cardboard boxes, and then like uh, 20 years later, I was doing Disney castles, and I was like, shit, I like and lucked out here. Um, there's uh, I use Cinema 4D to make this uh, in a kind of it's not you know it's not there's nothing fancy going on under here. It's a model. It's kit bashed off um, some elements of Turbo Squid. Some of mine bespokely made. Uh, put them together. What's I would use? I don't know if you any artists here, but like there's a, we use a normal pass, which is a kind of pass you create. So you get a beauty pass, we get a depth pass, we get a, a normal pass, which basically calculates where, where, you know, where, where the face is. So if you don't have time to do multiple lighting states, which you do now, but at the time it was a pain in the ass to render. Uh, this is about 10 years ago, I made this frame, but I worked with uh, the art director. Um, he did the 2D, I did the 3D and we rendered that stuff. So we were able to relight very quickly using the normal pass. So if you wanted to say, oh, I want some from here, uh, you could just grab it and they could grab that layer in Photoshop where so you take all the reds of that particular face and you just relight so you can do a magic thing. We also use the, the top normal to make to create the snow. Uh, so you just grab everything and then you can just go ahead, do a quick uh, white pass and uh, or you can render out a frost pass where I put a frost shader on everything and I'd render the whole castle like it was frosty and then you just put the two together and you paint out in 2D. So you very quickly can make kind of lots of nice little looks um, and sort of feel that I also set up cameras at the beginning because this is this is what one what in a concept art world you call like a hero silhouette. So we were designed. There were there are various bits of action that used to happen in here and in, in on rooftops, and then there were like key frames down here at the gates, and then there were other parts of the set where you had to work out like where it was a kind of conventional palace, like a sort of um, classic kind of French chateau that kind of got weirder and distorted when uh, he becomes a beast. So we had to sort of, uh, Sarah Green was a production designer. She's a very she's a brilliant production designer, one uh, multi-Oscar nominated designer. She had to, you know, had to work with her to get these, uh, this look. So like a sort of like weird castle that had grown out like a sort of uh, kind of cancer of like crazy architecture. Um, but what you're able to, what, what I would do in this process, I would have one camera locked sort of with a protection tag on it. And even though I was modeling in different things and x-refing stuff out i was always cognizant of the uh, the hero angle i didn't no one wanted me to mess once we nailed the hero silhouette which many many stakeholders had an opinion about you i didn't want to i couldn't really fuck with it so, part, excuse my french uh so i had to like uh so whatever i was doing here i was kind of manipulating frames but i knew that the hero silhouette the hero silhouette was uh intact um and uh, these are another things I don't know. Monster calls. I've had this. We didn't work on that, but we did a pitch for a, a well-known director at the time. He wanted to approach it, wanted to land the job. We had like a week to put together something, and this is like this is ten years old now. But I used ZBrush and Cinema to make this, so I modeled there. We had a location of a house that we liked. Um, the 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 book's very well illustrated, so we, that was a kind of like um, sort of inspiration. So I sculpted uh, this kind of hero mesh. I'm also pretty not a great painter and not a great sculptor, but I know how to create an image. And I'll, I'll either, if I can't, wherever I'm weak, I'll use artists in the studio to like, to, to sort of cover, like work, work with, or I will use the software to devise a way to make stuff. So this, this image I did do on my, on, on my own, it's kind of a, not great now. This is terrible, but like, this is 10 years old, but it's for a huge show called Gravity, but it was about iterative design. The designer uh, was uh, Andy Nicholson, and the director was Alfonso Cuaron, who's obviously quite a famous director, very visual, very meticulous, and he wanted to see many, many, many versions of very, very small details. And it was, it was, my, it was very, I didn't enjoy the process at all, uh, but I had to design a way to basically facilitate the client, in which case, if, again, if like we would, I think in this instance, I was trying to like lock in the, um, the jetpack design or the backpack design, and we would do many versions of this and have to print them out. So I created an instance of the astronaut uh, and the design pack, but rather than have to rend multiple angles out, I basically instance it under one camera. So whatever I was changing, it would just like iterate through. And so I was able to uh, print out, we had this huge art apartment with tables all the way through it. And Alfonso and Andy would come through at the end of the day and look at all the spaceships and the props thousands of versions of them on paper and he'd be like yes no yes no yes no yes no yes no and then all that feedback would come back and we would like go through and do it, do it again so it was kind of like designed by numbers this was this this one here i use cloners so cloners designed to do many many things but uh, i use it just to sort of like um 
pepper and blitz out uh, environments. So I use it on uh, Mowgli to do like um, natural environments. And here I was just making like loads of little sticks and stuff. This, these ones I, um, I would use, I use X-Frog. Um, this is a great plants and trees things. And I would make groups or like little biomes of collections of sort of at the beginning of the show, because I had to do so many um, natural environments. And when you're creating concepts of uh, um, kind of jungles and things, your eye can't focus, it's too, it's too noisy. So like when we're walking around the woods, it's a beautiful thing. But if it's, if it's in the morning or it's foggy, everything looks lovely, right? So generally when you're doing a th sort of concept art of, a, of an outdoor environment where there is too much information, you have to break it down into like manageable chunks. So use the depth pass to sort of um, crunch out it layers so that you can, so you can focus the, um, the viewer's eye. And when key, the key thing about concept art is, is to kind of create an image that will be in the trailer or some or it will become a seminal image that kind of sticks in everyone's minds so that one day the director or the DOP, even sort of like, they might not even be aware of it, subconsciously they'll have made that frame. You know? so, uh, one of the things that we'd really try and do is uh, is create kind of like at the very beginning of the process. These were done. Um, there are shots like this in the show, but these were done quite early on. So some sometimes they're done to create uh, to sell set designs. Sometimes they're done to sell get money for the show. <laughs> sometimes they're done just because the director has had an idea and wants to know if it's good, and the production designer would love to like show it to them to say, hey, actually this is great. This shows off my set. This sort of works here. Again, I can go into more detail about how I do this stuff, but the, this, this, there are like many, many little plants here. So I'll create little libraries of ferns and stones and stuff. I have like mid-ground, foreground, tree libraries, and I'll have like a series of like uh, groups of assets that um, I can just open up and use to dress a scene. So now, years later, so I'm still using the same things that I made like in a project 10 years ago. So I've got my twig and my, and they're like crappy. Some of them, like the modeling is awful, but it, uh, you get away with murder. So like, I've got these right, le really uh, low poly twigs and rocks and things. You just need, sometimes you just need to break up the floor so it doesn't look flat. Um, so you can just fire all the stuff and you can put like ID passes and depth passes and uh, like shiny passes. So when you come to do the uh, composite, you can just very, very quickly retweak and, 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 and make things look uh, nice. Well, hopefully they look nice. I, I still like these, even though I did them like 10 years ago. Um, another show I did was uh, Maleficent. So this is the other castle uh, uh, I worked on now. And because I, I'm okay, I'm not a great painter. I used to do traditional art, but because I, I, I run a studio now, so I rarely get to be on the box. Um, well, I say on the box, I'm on the, on the computer doing the work. I have to supervise many, many people now, so I rarely get to practice. And, and the, the name of our company is painting practice, but I, I don't get to practice painting anymore, which is ironic. Um, but the, 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 an image like that can take quite a long time. And if, uh, if, it, um, if the rep doesn't like it and you spent four days doing it, it kind of, it's, you know, it's not great. The designer can get a bit grumpy and you're like, oh, boo. So uh, what I would try and do before I commit the work that involves doing an image like that, which is kind of like a hero frame, uh, I will uh, make sure that the, the director, DOP or designer, likes the ideas behind the image. So these I would call like their thumbnails. I've got artists in the studio are brilliant at just doing that in 2D, that kind of 2D thumbnails. These are my like little 3D thumbnails that I like to do. Um, so I'm sort of maquetting, using, making like very low render settings, uh, simple models with a kind of like white card render render technique. And I used to get, I love Sketch and Tune. It's been around, it hasn't changed for ages, but I use Sketch and Tune to make these things. I use it for like technical illustrations, but I also use it to like create co the little concept art. But you're just getting like memorable little silhouettes, details in here and lighting ideas. So I can take these to the the designer first probably and say, hey, do you like these shots? And they're like, yeah, okay, I like the shots. Um, and then I'll be like, well, well I'll work up these versions where I've made, as I get through the production, especially if I'm working with a team of people, we've created lots of previous assets or concept artists that like made like decent models. Like this is a, a busy brush model that another concept artist has made. I have my team UV and rig it and texture it so I could, because once it was set on a design, it was worth doing that. So I was able to then pose that dragon into various cool like uh, frames. And then some of them like that, these, these I can do a, like, that, that five in a, in a day or even an afternoon. Um, one like that's a bit more involved. But like once you've gathered a lot of stuff, you can like bash out and create a lot of, lot of shots. Or right, I've got a bit speeding up, speeding up. Um, so here's uh, here's an example that illustrates the kind of set journey. So that was the original one of the original concept designs we did. 
that's the set build, which is pretty huge. It was, uh, we built it in a quarry in Wales and we built like that whole central area, which uh, it, in that instance, the, the port was up a mountain <laughs> uh, because we couldn't find a place where we could build next to the sea. Uh, we couldn't, that wasn't overlooked or big enough or looked good or would mean VFX everywhere. So I, uh, Joel and I came up with the idea that actually if we shot it here, we, we'd only have VFX um, in the harbor or the occasional big wide because you could shoot um, buildings and then in beyond you're into like rock walls. So you're not seeing like normal life. Uh, and we decided that because the um, sea or the water side, the harbor was the least of our problems because the show had many, I don't know if you know about his dark, the, his dark material is full of like these creatures called de demons and they're all like photoreal animals running around, which is where most of the money was. So putting a few sea shots uh, into our environment was, was, was the easy part. Um, so here's another thing. This was Lee Scoresby's balloon, which like Lima Miranda's character was in, and it was kind of so it was a kind of hero prop. We had to get it right, and we go through these stages. So there's like a 2D stage, 3D model, little mock-ups of like how it would use. Then we did a previews of how we introduced the character. Then he's built as a beautiful set, real one to one, and then you shoot shoot the sequence with the real with the real prop. Then frames that would like remodel the real prop, or we scan the real prop. And so sometimes if the shot if shots are doing something spectacular, it will come as a CG takeover. Right. Um, yeah, what's what? previs? So we do now we have like, um, there's many different styles of previs, and sometimes you have to like cater the previs to the director or the client because they don't like looking at a certain style or they don't, it, it freaks them out if you do it too developed or they like to see it really developed. Um, so you or you've got to do it very quickly, so you kind of like so. We've we're working on like f four different ways to previs things now, so it's depending on like, um use case scenario this is a really nice way so you've got a 3d environment a set but you don't like to bother texturing it or rendering it out we would render a 3d moves but then we would do 2d pass so you get the charm of a storyboard and we would just animate sort of on sixes of the character animation which means that you could do far iterative ideas of what the blocking is or the script can change and you're not like rendering out or redoing a lot of character animations pain in the ass takes ages uh, 3D previews, you need to do it in a case like this because things are going on that are pretty crazy. You've built a big world, you know what you're doing, you're sort of, everyone's into the idea, so you can go to the trouble of like animating some cool characters into a big environment. But we also need to like, the green screen here sort of shows like what we're shooting for real uh, in gray and what is green. Um, so everyone can start to break down shots in terms of like uh, how, how they're making it. Third one is kind of Unreal Engine previews, which we'll be doing much, much more of these days. So we will bring everything in and allows the directors to kind of do like live uh, cameras. So we'll, we'll, we'll lock in the blocking, we'll build nice environments, we're able to texture and light really quickly and it all looks lovely and you can render it really quickly. But then you get, and we'll render that out and we'll show that in a more conventional sense where we'll like, present the previews. And then, um, but it also then allows the director and the DOP to come into that environment and we've got like a small studio space where we can pick up an iPad or a camera or a little rig and they can like then pick the shots and to redo, redo, they would have to, if they want to reblock it, which is like reanimate the action, we would have to go, they say, come, come back in a day and we'll, we'll reblock it. But most of the times they're happy with the blocking and then they can just have a play. So many times on, uh, on the show, it really helps as well because when you get to shoot, which can cost, you know, hundreds of thousands, you know, tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of pounds per day, uh, everyone's under immense pressure to like get the shots you need and if we've given when we do a really small session which has cost nothing really or like you know maybe a thousand pounds to set it up with the team and stuff that it means give the directors like there's no pressure so they can just like think about the shots they've got a time to like rethink about it so when they actually come when they're all the toys then it's very expensive they feel kind of relaxed and they know the shots they need to get um, so it speeds up the shoot day um, and then the last one is when you mix everything up together. So you like you can have like a 3D shot, an Unreal shot, a 2D shot, and contextually it works because you're just selling each thing. Um, this is uh, yeah. So this is the stuff that we're move more and more Unreal stuff, and we've developed an app now and a plugin uh, called uh, Plan V, and we're doing um, which we're actually here today. Uh, uh, there's some uh, developers in uh, the Netherlands are helping us with that now. Um, and so um, we're updating it for you Unreal 5, but um, it's basically designing tools that allow smaller studios, freelancers, and bigger studios to um, simplify the workflows that we've been using and working out. So we're, and it's free and we're trying to like, so we're doing it as a kind of like, I don't know, holistic thing to give back. Here you can, exp this, this thing here explains like, that's the physical set. That, that shows you like where the stage is. And then the green layer again is like the set extension. 
So like when, um, when you're planning shots or working through the director, everyone's aware of like the money shots and the shots that are free. Um, so you can kind of like get the best um, angles in the shot. So that far right one is the, the there is a, a composite. So uh, this, this was a pretty large uh, set build. The stages in the, where we shoot this show in, um, in Wales are quite big. So we're able to get a real play of that element of the set. And then we, we designed this whole thing beforehand and had that in mind. In fact, in this instance, uh, the director, this is the first time we did it, we had the director in VR in a headset, it's like six years ago, and uh, they changed the set because they were like, they were in it and it was too claustrophobic for them. And I like, right, actually, let's, let's lose all these pillars and we just have two big ones. So we, and it was, it was great that we discovered that, you know, before we built the thing, because it would have cost an absolute fortune. Um, here is like, this is stuff we were doing in lockdown where we were trying to experiment with um, multiple users working in an environment together so we could even speed up the process even more. So you could have like, um, um, so like a set dresser or a layout artist moving props around and have someone else at the same time doing the cameras. So we have uh, a lot of like people doing like uh, the blocking of a scene. So this is the Trollison example again. And we were doing like a, a scene where Lyra is getting chased by a, like a, or trying to chasing Yorick before he's smashing up the town. Um, and we'd sort of made a thing. So you could, act, you could have two people working in tandem in the same scene file. Um, Here's a, another thing. So this is this. This was like I'm gonna do. Am I running out of time here? Like four minutes. Left. Four minutes. So uh, here's another asset journey. Yorick, kind of the bear. So 2D, just look look uh, 2D look dev. Um, then we make, make a previous character, and then we're showing like how to um, work out like how it was gonna be rigged. So we made like a puppet rig or a two person like um, thing here. So it's a really weird looking thing. It's like, it's, there's something so wrong about that. I don't know, but anyway. So uh, it's a, like a, and they, it's quite a sophisticated rig that, that you could just like, well, actually it's not that sophisticated, is it? So just doing that. But, um, but, it, but we were able to calculate the gait of Yorick and the natural movement of like how, how large that so it doesn't look. These things are called bucks, which means any physical thing that you want to get rid of but you need it in there to get the shot right so it doesn't look terrible or you don't have to make the shot cost an absolute fortune because it all went wrong, you have to fix it, right? So um, again, we, uh, we're sort of part and part of all of that process, doing that, doing all the different arm of figures, previs, that's the like, Unreal previs, and then the fi final stage frame store, take it over the line and, and do an amazing shot like that where it's completely real. So, but we have to have done all those steps to make that process better um, you can't, you know, you can always, if you've got enough money to a point, if you've got enough money, you can always just like everything in VFX. But if you plan and plan and plan and plan, you can push your VFX budget way further. And that's kind of our, our key thing. And also design is massive. Like if you, you know, it's like, it's such a key part of the process. Um, here's another one. So this is the Trollison thing. It starts with references. Uh, then it's kind of like early concept art, which I did six months before the show and even pre-production like Lego sets, real set, drones, we sort of did drone, drone scans. So we have a drone scan photogrammetry in here. Uh, that shows you like the set extension proposal so everyone can cross it out. Then we've got like really detailed stuff with the art department about what we're building, what, which ones, what the references are, like what the numbered are. Then we've, kind of, then we've built it, we can plan through the previs. Then it's built, it's like massive. It takes like six, seven months, costs like, you know, a lot of money. There, there's, there's the sets with like extensions in, so it's walking through, and then you can kind of go through the process and you do like the final scene there on the end, which is the post fizz where, so right the way through. And we're involved in all of the processes right right through the end. Um, I, think that's the, I think that's it, isn't it? That's it, the, you wanna play this? So this is the, um, this is the work that we did, for example, on Halo. Uh, we just came out uh, this summer. Um, on episode two specifically, but you can see how we so we use cinema and you know so, so the Unreal Engine to to an extent and put everything together, and how you know from previous to final image you can really see the continuity of that. And this previous clearly allowed them to understand uh, how they would shoot this scene as well as sort of put together the VFX costs and sort of from the script, understanding which one was the best way to be able to represent uh, what was in the script. So it's always pretty nice to see the previous come to life, you know, exactly as it was uh, planned. Which is not always the case, sadly, but, <laughs> but yeah. And do you wanna, yeah. Yeah, is that, I can't remember that. That's it, isn't it? Or is it post-visual? 
can't remember. Yeah, so here's another one. So this is a, so previous, there's post viz, which is basically after everything's shot, sometimes it's gone to plan, sometimes it's not. When it hasn't gone to plan or we need to elevate different parts of the show or need more wide shots or there is a sequence that didn't quite make sense and we might have to do a reshoot or something or you need to like get the money right, we would do a post viz phase so to design the shot so that, the, that when we're delivering the shot, they're getting it, minimizing the iterative sort of process for, for, the, for the post house. Um, and you can see here, these are all like, you know, I suppose we get like 80, 90% of the way there on the shots in editorial. And then the final shots on the right hand side. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Oh yeah, virtual pre-production. But yeah, I can ask, a, 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 I can get into any kind of detail afterwards, but we'd, we're, if you wanna know, we're doing a load of cool stuff now in the, I would say virtual pre-production space. We're working on shows doing virtual production but we're prepping them in terms of the design of their assets. We're helping them uh, build stuff. I'm doing it using um, uh, kind of camera tracking stuff. So it's a kind of hybrid where you get um, final graphics afterwards, but you're getting, you can see on the monitor um, the set extension. So it's not like you're not baking in the VFX, which is what virtual production is on Mandalorian, shows like that but you're getting the, the director of the OP and everyone's getting a sense of what it's gonna look like. So you do better framing, which is my preferred route because you're not so, it's, it's less expensive because you're not having to deal with the LEDs, um, but you're getting the look dev and everyone's understanding. And often it's very frustrating for lots of people when you're working on like green screen sets, even if you've got a reasonable set build there, but there's a lot of green, um, you have to like, it's uh, it often makes cameraman and uh, even crane up at anyone, like various people, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna stay on the set, it looks a lot nicer, right? But actually the move would actually be nice if it actually came off of the set and you go into the rigging and everything else. And everyone's like, oh, don't do that. It's going to go. but, but if you've got, if you can see the set extension, you can see the, the, the full picture, which is what this, a lot of these um, companies are doing now. So the camp, that live camera tracking, that means that you can just get a lot, much, much better shots. Uh, and then also in po when it comes to actually doing the post vids before you lock the cut, which is a really key stage because it costs very, a lot of money if you keep the edits open, um, you can lock a lot quicker. There you go. Anyway, great, thank you. <laughs>